and welcome to Her Business, where we interview inspiring businesswomen and entrepreneurs. I'm Susie Daphnis of the Australian Business Women's Network. My guest today is Kim Anderson, Chief Executive of TheReadingRoom.com, an online community for readers. She's also a non-executive director of carsales.com.au, a publicly listed company. In this interview, we talk about the publishing industry, how it's changed, and what the opportunities are for all of us to be publishers. We also talk about diversity on boards and why a truly diverse board needs to look beyond gender diversity to be truly successful. Enjoy this interview with Kim Anderson. Kim, hi, and welcome to the program. Hi, Susie. Thank you so much for joining us here today at Her Business. Tell us about your new business, The Reading Room. Well, TheReadingRoom.com was set up to um, really unite uh, readers online, um, help them find each other and to get good book recommendations, to join online book clubs and really to uh, find a space where they could talk about really good books and meet like-minded readers. So it really is a social network for readers. Some people have called it Facebook for readers. Mm -hmm. Um, it's probably a little bit more broad than that. We do actually include published reviews from sources like the New York Times and The Guardian, so making a lot more um, information about books and critical analysis available to our members. But it is a commercial venture, so I think my career has been punctured by um, opportunities to do things differently, and I just felt that this was a gap in the market that... Um, we could actually fill and uh, do so commercially. So we are, we do take advertising, and eventually we will um, offer ebooks for sale. Great. And your background does span a wide range of media, including book, magazine, newspaper publishing, so traditional print media. You were mm -hmm. also involved with the development of the 9MSN portal and so have transitioned to, um, to online publishing as well. Tell us about that transition that you made yes and that's um it, it has been um an interesting journey i have to say as a book publisher i was constantly um thrown the issue of living in a very small market in australia mm -hmm. with not much access to audience and uh production costs that were not dissimilar to the costs of producing a book in a larger market like the us or the uk so I spent a lot of my publishing career, my early book publishing career, trying to solve um, that issue, particularly when we were talking about large reference books. So um, anything that required illustration or printing offshore was always quite difficult. So I spent a great deal of my time thinking about ways we could use electronic media to um, solve the issues of expensive publishing. So in the late... Uh, 1980s and early 1990s, I developed a number of electronic, what could be considered very early electronic publishing formats, including uh, an electronic index, which went on to win the index of the indexing medal. And also, um, I was publishing James Halliday at the time, and we needed to be able to publish him not just in uh, global markets, but in global markets quickly. A lot of the material that James writes dates very quickly. Mm -hmm. So I started working on looking at different electronic formats, including CD-ROM. And um, at the time, I was working for HarperCollins, and they invited me to go and live in New York and develop electronic products for um, the US marketplace, which was incredibly exciting because HarperCollins at the time had... Um, Bought Harper and Row, which had the most uh, significant collection of Australian children's writing in the world. Uh, they had just bought uh, or combined with 20th Century Fox, so we had access to television and uh, movie studios. And of course, Rupert Mur Murdoch had been making a number of acquisitions in the areas of electronic media, including electronic mapping and gaming and so on. So it was a very um, pioneering role. Uh, we got a lot wrong, you always do, when I think you start these things up. Um, but it was exciting to live in New York and it was exciting to really be at the forefront of when the web was invented and the possibilities that it, um, it threw up to uh, both publishers and anybody, in fact, in the entertainment business. Mm -hmm. um, so when I returned to Australia, I actually um, had decided that perhaps the future wasn't in print, which was... Um, 
not so much foresight, just uh, just from the experience of seeing what you could achieve online. And I joined um, Daniel Petrie and then Steve Vamos and others to set up 9MSN. So that was um, my first foray into the web. And it was an environment that I found incredibly stimulating in incredibly complex but also very fast moving and uh, it was an environment that I really enjoyed. When so much has changed it surprises me and I wonder if it does you how many parts of the traditional publishing industry especially books are still stuck <laughs> in the land that they can't seem to get out of. You don't have to comment on that but uh, we do publish they, they... quite a bit and, uh, and I'm just surprised. It is very surprising. I think a, a great deal of uh, people we speak to are quite frustrated um, about the time in which it's taken those changes to occur. But I think it's a very complex environment. I mean, book publishing has a number of areas that need to be considered in making a transition um, during a disruptive period like we're going through now. And not least of those are the author and how the author is treated in different markets. Um, without the internet, for many years, publishers have had to rely on other publishing houses and, and their parent or their sister publishing house to do the marketing and and publicity and I guess with the internet those uh, barriers to uh, markets and those barriers to audiences are coming down so it requires a lot of rethinking on how you distribute rights, um, how you balance the cost of producing a print book versus the cost of producing an e-book and where the differences in cost start to arise. So there's so many different things to consider I think that um, it has been perplexing and will be perplexing for some time. Let's look at how perhaps, you know, our, our, our listeners are, you know, women in business, they're bloggers, they're women in small business. What opportunities do we each have now to be publishers? Well, look, the, I think the barriers to entry for the internet are obviously are very, very low and it's possible for anyone to write a blog and it's possible for anyone to become self-published, much more so than in the past. The question is, you know, when you look at the number of websites out there, and there are billions, how do you get found? And, and that requires not just the savviness of being able to write well or to have interesting things to say or to impart experience and wisdom. It also requires you to be at the forefront of technology. It requires you to understand how to um, search engine optimize optimise yourself on Bing and on Google. It requires, um, you know, the way in which you build your website, the way in which the URLs are found and so on. So it's actually, although the barriers to entry are very low, the expectations of how you might get found um, are quite real. And I think that uh, people don't often plan for that component. And they think, well, I've written my blog and it's very interesting. Now, why aren't people flocking to it? Um, interestingly, there's a new um, a new sort of site out called Tumblr, mm. which is uh, T-U-M-B-L-R, which is a place where you can go and create, create your blog and actually the blogs are all indexed and um, a bit like organised into a book if you want but uh, that, that's a great place for people to start because people go to Tumblr to find blogs on particular subjects so instead of seeing all of these blogs sort of sprayed throughout the internet you actually have an aggregation of blogs taking place. So the thing I th love about technology is that it never stands still. It's not like traditional industries where the model is clear and the model is set and then the model continues until such time as it breaks. Uh, in the technology world, the model is constantly being challenged by new technologies and new ways of doing things. So, you know, six months ago we didn't have Tumblr, today we have Tumblr. You know, three years ago we didn't have Facebook, today we have Facebook. Um, so, you know, it's a, it's a very exciting world, but to keep up with it, it, it means that we all have to, in our own little ways, become experts in technology. Which is, I think, such an exciting opportunity. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> it is it's sort of a core skill. I think. I think anybody going into the work environment these days has to understand that working out where the things are going and using the web and the tools that the web provides are part of their core competencies. 
one of the things I wanted to talk with you about today is actually another role you play other than the head of the reading room and that is that of being on boards and we are big advocates of getting more and more women on boards and I know this is not your first time being on a board but you are on the carsales.com.au board which is um, a public board which is a little bit different to some of the previous roles you've had. Tell us how being on a publicly on the board of a publicly listed company, how is that different to perhaps being part of a startup or a not-for-profit or some of the other roles you've had? Mm. Well, I think I think the um, the difference between being on a public board and a non-public board is that in a non-public board, I guess you have a, a, a group of shareholders who are probably much smaller and hold you much more accountable on a sort of one-to-one basis. On a public board, of course, uh, your shareholders can be institutions, they can be individuals or retailers, they can be uh, other people sitting around the board table. But I think the the role is uh, very similar and that is, you know, that you're sitting there um, really holding the CEO and his team accountable to the shareholders and ensuring that the shareholders are represented and that you make decisions that will benefit them. So uh, it, I guess the, um, the difference probably, and particularly if you're talking um, to the CEOs of these companies, is that um, informing the market, keeping a much broader and diverse group of people informed is really very important and ensuring that um, those checks and balances have taken place continu- continually and sort of vigilantly is very important. You're speaking at the annual Women on Boards conference on a panel about diversity on boards and so what I'd like to ask you is your thoughts about the role that diversity should play when it comes to a board, regardless of whether it's a public board or not? Well, I think diversity is very important, but I think that we tend to, when we're talking about diversity, we tend to immediately assume we're talking about gender diversity. And I think that having a balance of people on a board is an extremely important um, thing to have, but I also think that it may not just be about gender diversity. So if you take something like uh, a company like carsales.com, the most important diversity aspects of that board are to ensure that all your constituents are represented. And by constituents, you know, in that particular instance, I would say, you know, you need obviously an independent board members who are there representing the shareholders. You need um, board members who have a good knowledge, for example, of the car industry. Um, you have board members who have a good knowledge of the technology industry. Um, and then you have board members who may have a very good knowledge of, say, car dealerships and the car, car dealer network. So I think diversity is about ensuring that you have around the table a group of people who each bring something differently or each bring something different rather to the table um, and who represent in some way some constituents who are um, interacting with the company. So I do think it's important to have women on boards because I think that um, quite often, uh, you know, women think, and I think it's important not just to have gender diversity, which I think is important in any room, whether at a board boardroom or any other room. But I think it's important to have um, women understand that this is another part of the career um, lifespan that they can have and that they can contribute to. So I think it's very, um, you know, we have had a situation in this country where board representation by women has been very, very low. And there is, I think, an important role for women to show best practice and to demonstrate um, that this is a very considered and a very um, enjoyable and worthwhile career for some women to pursue. You're doing that certainly by the words that you've just shared with us here any advice that you would give women looking to get on boards? Well, I think that um, the most important thing about wanting to be on boards is to really think hard about, can I make a contribution to that board? Can I make a difference? Is there a need for the skills that I have for that board? 
And I think um, the way in which you can test those sorts of things is to be involved in your own industry to start. Um, in things like committees, you know, if you're um, looking at the future or whether you're involved in the, um, you know, various committees that a company set up to deal with everything from equal opportunity to, um, you know, the, the social committee. I think it's a very good practice to get into the habit of um, joining committees and being involved in the direction of your company. And then I think as you um, get get skills or acquire skills that help you um, work in those team environments, then to apply them to different industries is also, I think, very beneficial. So, my background was um, to start with in very, very small private boards of very small private companies to move into, then then I moved into not-for-profit and I found the not-for-profit uh, board room tables are probably more challenging than I suspect uh, publicly listed companies because you quite often have um, board members there who are um, not necessarily skilled in all the areas that you would normally expect a board member to be skilled in financial, for example, financial expertise and the understanding of the accounts and those sorts of things. Quite often a lot of people in not-for-profit boards are there because they're representing a particular sector. Um, so, you know, and that doesn't mean they don't contribute equally and they don't build that expertise, but often particularly in new boards, you'll find that um, if they're representing constituents that they might not have all the skills that, um, that are required. And a very good example of that is the, the University of Sydney Senate in which I sat for six years. Um, every year, you know, the, the Senate is required to elect an undergraduate and a graduate student member and they're there for a year. Now, it's wonderful. They come in, they they don't know anything about sitting on boards and they get schooled on, well, here are the issues, here are the papers, here is what we require. We, we try and um, send them off to courses and so on so that they can start to learn what the role of a board is and how the board must hold the CEO and the organisation accountable for what they say is going to happen. So often not-for-profits might, you know, Sydney University is a, a good example of that kind of diversity because you have student members, you have alumni members of the board and you have, um, you know, ex extremely skilled um, financial um, often retired CEOs sitting on that board to give back. And so you get this kind of very broad mix of skills and a very broad mix of experience that is quite often hard to manage. It's much harder to manage than it is, say, an ASX listed board where you expect that the people coming to the table will already have the skill set. Um, so it provides a, a range of different challenges that I think are, are very rewarding. Hmm. Before we finish up today, I do want to ask you about your business, The Reading Room. Tell me what are you enjoying most about this business? Uh, I, I love the fact that it just changes daily. I mean, we are in a very disruptive uh, period for the book industry and nobody quite knows how it's going to um, land. But I, I think the most challenging and the most interesting things I find are the ways in which audiences want to engage with authors um, and the ways in which we can foster that. So, you know, three years ago it would be the way you met an author was to go to a bookshop and listen to that author read from their work mm -hmm. and answer questions and sign books and now I think you can access the authors talking about their books you can have you can hold online chats they can join book clubs um, so there's much more engagement between author and reader which I think is a really exciting period um, in the evolution of book publishing um, and I think it's just enjoyable to always to discover new books and it just you know, just have this list of books that gets longer and longer about <laughs> what you should read before you die and then all of a sudden <laughs> somebody comes along with another author that you've never heard of and you think gosh you know how and and I think the other thing that is really enjoyable now is seeing all the classics come back um, and be available to you know once upon a time something went out of print it was hard to get it was hard hard to find and now all of that is accessible at your fingertips it's a very very exciting period 
and it's just fun to be part of it. And look, we we've got things wrong and we've got things right, and it, you know, you take ten steps forward and two steps back, but. Those sorts of challenges, I think, are the things that keep you awake at night and they're the sorts of things that tell you that there's a sort of brave new world that you need to discover. And that you're alive. <laughs> and that you're alive. <laughs> Even when you're dead on your feet. <laughs> there's that too. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, the very best of our wishes for uh, the reading room and we'll make sure that we put the website address up on our website so that people can follow that and join that community. Thanks, Susie. Thank you. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed this interview with Kim Anderson of The Reading Room. You can learn more about Kim's business at www dot the reading room dot com. This is Susie Daphnis of the Australian Business Women's Network, a national training and mentoring organisation for business women. If you're ready to be connected to inspiring women who are making a difference to the business landscape, ask us today about our membership programs. And for more interviews with inspiring women, visit our website www.abn.org.au.